Number 14. A compound is found to contain 40% carbon, 6.7% hydrogen, and 53.3% oxygen. Well, now, what could the compound be? Very often, students, when they see percentages like this, they r rush into doing a table for empirical formula. Actually, we can keep in mind that this is a multiple choice question. There are suggested answers A, B, C, and D. We could actually use the suggested answer to make our working slightly simpler. Let me show you what I mean. So, first of all, let's write out the formulas for the four options. Ethanol. We have C2H5OH, ethanoic acid, methanol, and methanoic acid. Now, these are the formulas. We will use the periodic table to find out their respective a relative molecular mass so you can pause the video at this moment to figure out the molecular masses on your own right I'll fill in the numbers now 46 60 for ethanoic acid methanol 32 methanoic acid 46 now once we have all these molecular masses let's use Let's try to find out the percentage of hydrogen. You can choose percentage of carbon, oxygen, right? For me, I'll use hydrogen. For ethanol, there are six hydrogens, so and each one being one. So six over 46 will be the percentage of hydrogen. And using our calculator, we will find that it's about... Uh, 13%. So what we'll be doing will be finding out the, the respective hydrogen percentages and then see which one fulfills the condition of 6.7%. So going down the options, ethanoic acid, there are 4 hydrogen out of 60. That gives us 6.67 right, or 6.7. So it seems that ethanoic acid is our answer. Right, let's check the rest of the options just to make sure. Methanol, 4 hydrogen out of 32. That gives us 12.5%. And methanoic acid, we have 2 hydrogen out of 46. That gives us 4.3%. So using this approach, we can see that ethanoic acid is the unknown compound. Number 15, repeating unit of a polymer. So the easiest way to find out what is the original monomer is to remove the single bonds found on either side. So Meaning, let's get rid of this. Let's get rid of this single bonds on either side. And then the original monomer should have the double bond between these two carbons. And then if you look at the structure, this is longest chain will be uh, 1, 2, and 3. So it's a propene and it's a methyl propene. Right, notice that we do not have the same two methyl propene because there's only one position that we can have along the chain that will make it a branch. Sixteen. This is the Boltzmann's distribution. So, energy distribution, What, which of the following statements is true? A, position A 
represents the mean energy of a molecule in the container. So this is position A. This is not the mean energy. This is not the average energy. This is basically the energy which the most or the highest portion of molecules or should I say the highest portion of molecules have this particular energy. That is different from saying that this is the average energy. Right. Most molecules have this energy but it is not the average energy. So A, option A is not correct. B, addition of a catalyst move moves the position of the activation energy to the right. Now, addition of a catalyst will lower the activation energy. All right, so if there was a catalyst, this is the initial activation energy. We will expect the activation energy with a catalyst in the presence of a catalyst to be shifted to the left. So option B is incorrect. Right, the catalyst lowers the activation energy. The area under the curve to the right of the activation energy represents a number of molecules with enough energy to react. So this is the correct statement. Right. For, to study the curve, particles with activation energy or more than the activation energy will have sufficient energy to react. So that is, we are talking about the portion in this region here. Because to the left will be particles with less than the activation energy. To the right will be the particles with enough energy to react. So C is our answer. Let's check D. The position of the peak of the curve at a higher temperature is further away from both axes. Now, a temperature that is higher, the shape of the curve will look something like this. Right? So, let's go back to the option. The position of the peak. So, taking that the peak is here, it is further away from the vertical axis compared to the one with the lower temperature but it's actually, if you are looking at the horizontal axis right, the peak is actually nearer to the horizontal axis as compared to the one with the lower temperature so it is not true that it's further away from both axes is only further away from the vertical axis. Number 17, tetradecane is found in crude oil and is heated and cracked. Right, this is what we call cracking. It decomposes to form one molecule of hexane and three more molecules. Right, let's keep in mind this information. Which of the following could represent this reaction? So let's eliminate some of the impossible options first. Hexane. Right, hexane should be a 6 carbon alkane. And being an alkane, C6H. 14, right? 2 times of 6 plus 2. So we have 14 hydrogen. So looking at the options, right, we can see that option C is incorrect because option C is actually a pentane. Right, not a hexane. So C is out. And then we have the information that there are 3 more molecules besides hexane. And using that information, Option B is out because option B only has two more molecules besides the hexane. So B is incorrect. Right, we are down to options A and D. We have hexane. 
for both of them. So it's a matter of making sure the equation is balanced. So let's try to balance the hydrogen. We have 30 hydrogen here, 14, 8, and 8, 2 times of 4. So we have 30 hydrogen here. Looking at the hydrogen for option D, 30 hydrogen, 14, 6, and 12. 2 times of 6, we ended up with 32 hydrogen. So option D, there's a wrong accounting of hydrogen for option D. Therefore, A is the answer. Eighteen structure of cyclohexene and what is the general formula for cyclic alkenes such like this right it's an alkene because of the double bond and it's cyclic because it forms a ring one straightforward way to do this is to figure out the number of hydrogens we have in this molecule the important thing is that carbon should form four bonds so Let's start out with this carbon here. Two is joined to other carbons, so there are two hydrogen here. There are two hydrogen for this carbon. Two hydrogen. We are making sure that each hydrogen or each carbon is joined to four bonds. There are two hydrogen here. This carbon, three of the bonds are already used up, so there's only one hydrogen. Same for this carbon, three bonds are being used, so we have one hydrogen. So this is the number of hydrogens for this cyclohexene. So we have six carbons and total number of hydrogen, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. C6H10. And then if you were to compare to the general formula, It will be B, right? C six H two times six, we get twelve, and then minus two, we get ten. Nineteen A and B are reacted in a reversible reaction, so. We have 10 moles of A and 10 moles of B. This is the initial amount. And at the end, during equilibrium, we have 4 moles of B, among other substances. So what is the total amount in moles of the substances? Now, for me, the neatest way to keep track of all the reactions will be to draw a table. So I'll do this on the right side. A, 3B. And we have C and 2D. The table, I will remember it as an ice table where we have initial, the change, IC, and then E will be our equilibrium. So let's fill in the information that we have. Initially, we have 10 moles of A and 10 moles of B. Now, there weren't any products formed yet, so 0 C and 0 moles of D initially. The next information that we were given will be at the end of the reaction or actually during equilibrium, we have 4 moles of B in the reactor. So equilibrium, 4 moles of B. Now these are the this is the information provided in the question. We should be able to fill in all the rest of the information right, to find out the equilibrium amount. So how do we do this? We start off with this column. We know that B, there are 10 at the start initially and there are 4 in the end. That means the change will be a decrease of 6 moles. Right, 10, we decrease by 6, we get 4 moles. In other words, 
six moles of B have reacted. Once we know this important information, we can find out the number of moles of A that has also reacted. Right. Based on the mole ratio, three moles of B reacts with one mole of A. So if six moles of B has reacted, we will know that one third of the amount will be reacting with, or one third of A will be reacted. Or should I say, six moles of B reacted, all right, one third of the amount, which is two moles, will be whatever A is reacting. So, what other products form? We will still use the ratio. Let's use A for convenience. One mole of A will produce one mole of C based on the balance equation. So, if two moles of A has reacted, two moles of C will be produced because they are in the ratio 1 is to 1. And to find out D, the ratio between A and D is 1 is to 2. So if we have two moles of A used up or reacted, we will have four moles of D produced. So now we have all the respective changes for the substances. Let's find out the equilibrium amount. Initial and the change. So initially for A, we have 10 and two, two moles have reacted. We have eight moles remaining. For C, there were no C at the start and then we have created two moles of C. So we have two moles of C in equilibrium. We don't have any D in the beginning. We created four moles of D. We have four moles of D in the end. So these are our respective equilibrium amounts. Our total will be simply to add up everything. 8, 4, 2 and 4. That gives us a total of 18 moles. Right, so I would suggest getting very comfortable with creating a table, initial, change, and the equilibrium, and then you should be able to piece together all the other information. Number 20, what is the amount of hydrated copper sulfate? if we want to have a solution with this concentration. So let's start off with this information. 50 cubic centimeter, 0 0.4 moles per cubic decimeter. So let's find out the moles of copper sulfate that we require. Most of copper sulfate needed, we will have concentration of the solution multiplied by the volume of solution 0 0.4 moles per dm cube multiplied by 50 over 1000 dm cube. Right? Remember to convert the cubic centimeter to dm cube. We can put this into our calculator. we will need 0 0.02 moles of CuSO4. Okay, and then the idea is one mole of Cu of hydrated copper sulfate will produce one mole of CuSO4. Right? Because if, if you look at the formula, one mole of copper sulfate Right, do not be distracted by the water of crystallization. One mole of copper sulfate hydrated will produce one mole of copper sulfate. So if we if we do need 0 0.02 moles of copper sulfate, that will be supplied by 0 0.02 moles of hydrated copper sulfate. Right, and then that will be a simple calculation. If we have 
If you need 0 0.02 moles of hydrated copper sulfate, what will be the actual mass we will take? The number of moles of hydrated copper sulfate multiplied by the MR of hydrated copper sulfate. We will get the, the mass of 4.99 grams. That will be D. Twenty one. Which of the following following shows how the equilibrium yield is affected by the changes? Right. So let's let's take a look at the effect of Kc first. Now Kc, the useful information or useful thing that you have to keep note is take note of is Kc is affected by temperature. by changes in temperature. It's not affected by pressure or catalyst or uh, amount of reactants and products. So using that information, we can see that we can actually eliminate A because A says that changing the pressure affects the Kc, equilibrium constant. That is not correct. It should be, there should be no change on Kc when we change the pressure. B is possible. Let's keep that in mind. All right? C, changing temperature, it might increase the Kc, so let's keep that in mind also. D, changing the amount of reactants and products should not affect the Kc. Right? That's only affected by the temperature, so D is also out. So it's between B and C. Let's look at B. Adding a catalyst. Right, a catalyst will increase the speed of reaction. It should not change the yield. The yield will be the same in the presence or absence of a catalyst. Right, the only difference is whether we will get the yield at a shorter time or a longer time. So there should be no effect on the equilibrium yield if we have a catalyst. So A, B, and D are incorrect. That leaves us with C. Let's take a closer look at why C is correct. Mm. Expressing the Kc in this case, Kc will be hydrogen concentration to the power of 3, carbon monoxide, over the reactants CH4, methane, and water. Now, increasing the temperature, right? The forward reaction is an endothermic reaction. It's a positive sign, so the forward reaction is endothermic. When we increase the temperature, Remember that the system will react to counteract the change. So by increasing the temperature, we shift the equilibrium to the left, or sorry, to the right, because they will want to decrease the temperature, they will want to favor the endothermic reaction. If we shift the equilibrium to the right, what happens is we will get more of our products. The hydrogen and the carbon monoxide, there will be a higher concentration. The reactants, we expect them to be a lower amount. right? And then if we use our concepts, the numerator is increasing, the denominator is decreasing, overall your Kc will be expected to increase. So for this particular reaction, increasing the temperature will increase will increase our Kc. Right? Increasing the temperature will also allow us to get more hydrogen because the equilibrium is shifted to the right.
Question 22. Calculate the missing bond enthalpy. Right, this is information is related to question 21. Methane, water and carbon monoxide and hydrogen. So let's draw the bonds for reference down here with methane. water molecule and then we have carbon monoxide which is a triple bond and we have three hydrogen molecules so this is this is the information we have the num the bonds that we need to find or the unknown bond will be the bond energy for carbon monoxide so let us assign it to be an unknown x so Detailed wise, bond breaking. Let's find out the energy in bond breaking. Bond breaking will be the for the reactants. For bond breaking, we have four CH bonds to be broken and two OH bonds. Right, we need to break all the bonds in the reactants and then referring to the table 4 multiplied by 4, 1, 3 that's for CH, carbon, hydrogen for oxygen and hydrogen we have 2 times of 4, 6, 3 okay, and then input in our calculator One, two, five, seven, eight. So we will need two, five, seven, eight kilojoules to break all the bonds on the left side, and it's also useful to know that for bond breaking, it is an endothermic reaction. So it will be a good habit to assign your positive sign over here, right? On the other side, bond forming. Use a different color. Bond forming. The energy involved. We have the unknown carbon monoxide. Assign it to be X. And then we have three times of hydrogen. Three, four, three, six. So the energy change for the second part bond forming it is and uh, it is a bond forming process it should be exothermic energy should be given off so let's assign it to be negative three times of four three six one three zero eight right so overall energy change The overall energy change actually is was given in the information earlier. The overall energy change is plus 206. So let's, let's put that in the overall energy change. It's plus 206. And how do we get the overall? It's actually the summation of the two stages. Right? Bond breaking and bond forming. So we have plus 2578. Right, we got it from here. And then we add it to the second one the overall change we should expect a 206 right and then if you remove the brackets we 
we have a simple mathematical equation. Right, working out minus x right, will be minus one zero six four and then x will simply be one zero six four. That is the bond energy of the carbon monoxide. So answer will be B. Number 23. Two moles of ideal gas were stored. What, which of the following changes will lead to the highest pressure, greatest increase in pressure inside the flask? So let's make use of the ideal law, ideal gas equation, where we know that pressure times volume is equal to number of moles of gas, gas constant and temperature, right? temperature being Kelvin's. So the respective pressure eventually will be nRT over V. So let's see the initial pressure. Let's have an idea of initial pressure. The number of moles at this in this basis will be two moles. So n equals to two. The gas constant we will we will just keep it as R. The temperature will be twenty because if you look at the options, right? They say changes from twenty to another chosen temperature so right, the original temperature will be 20 20 will be in degrees celsius we need to convert it to kelvins so 273 plus 20 we get 293 and then volume we do not know what that is we can simply just leave it as v right it is a fixed volume right, it's not a big issue so this is our initial amount Let's compare the options. A. Increasing the temperature from 20 to 200. In other words, the new pressure. Let's just put it as PA, right, for option A. The temperature, the number of moles is still 2. There's no increase in the gases. Gas constant is still R. The temperature changes, is the temperature is now 200 degrees. So 200 plus 273, we have 473, and then we have V. Right. Let's need to it up. 2 multiplied by 473, we have 946R over V. So this is the pressure for A. For B, adding one mole of gas X. Right. So what has changed? Pressure for B, the number of moles have changed. We started off with two. Now we added one mole. We have three moles of gas. R. Right. The temperature. As a basis, is there's no change in the temperature, so we will use the original temperature, 293 over V, and then we multiply 3 and 293, we will get 879 V over R. Option C, I'll do it on the left side. Right, adding half a mole of argon gas now this is actually essentially adding a inert gas so we can actually just view it as there's two and a half moles of gas in total now right two of two moles of the gas x and then another half moles of the argon gas so 2.5 number of moles total gases are 
and then the temperature is now raised to 150. So 150 added to 273, we have 4, 2, 3 Kelvins over V. Right, we put the two numbers together. We will have 1, let me check the calculator, 2.5. Multiplied by 423. We have 1057.5 R over V. Right. This is the temperature or this is the pressure for C. For D, removing half a mole of gas X. So for D, we will have only one and a half moles of x for gas x right because we have two and then we move half moles r and temperature is 300 degrees celsius so our in terms of kelvins will be 573 over v right putting these numbers together 1.5 multiplied by 573 We have eight five nine and a half R over V. So now we have four pressures condition. If you compare all of them, you will see that the one that gives us a higher value, highest value will be change C one zero five seven and a half R over V. It doesn't matter what V is, right? That is not important to us. So our answer is C. So that's it for the multiple choice questions for paper 2. I hope that it has been useful to you.